Hello and welcome to this week's Arab Digest podcast. I'm William Law, editor of the Digest. Our daily newsletter has no sponsors and we carry the podcast without any advertising. We are an independent voice supported only by our subscribers. And we're going to keep it that way. Check us out at ArabDigest.org. When you get to the website, you'll find details on how to receive our reader-supported daily newsletter for two months for free. If you haven't already, give us a try. You won't regret it. My guest today is Christian Coates Ulrichsen, a Middle East fellow at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy in Houston, Texas. Christian is a regular contributor to the Arab Digest newsletter and podcast and the author of several books on the Gulf states. His most recent is the award-winning Centers of Power in the Gulf States, published by Hearst. Christian has joined us today to talk about the year that the Saudi Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, has had. Christian, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be back. Before we focus on Mohammed bin Salman and the year he's had in 2024, I want to ask you just briefly about the situation in Syria where uh, this rebel group, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, HDS, has broken out of Idlib, uh, seized uh, Aleppo, threatening other Syrian cities. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it has taken most people by surprise, including those in the Gulf, which had effectively normalized and rehabilitated the Assad regime, taken them by surprise, perhaps by the speed with which the regime seems to have once again lost control over critical areas of northern Syria. And it's a reminder, I think, that for all the attempts in the Gulf, or certain parts of the Gulf, to bring Assad back in from the cold, the issues of 2011 and the civil war remain very much in play. And I think what we're seeing in terms of a Russian and Iranian response is only going to once again... uh, bring the Syrian conflict back into the center of regional geopolitics, where I think the position in some of the Gulf countries, especially Saudi Arabia, UAE and Bahrain, had been that this was effectively resolved. And I think the last few days have shown that it isn't. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, of course, Hezbollah is weakened, the Russians fully engaged in Ukraine, uh, you know, maybe now is seen as a good time for HDS to make their move. They clearly thought it was. But look, let's let's move on now to Mohammed bin Salman. We're drawing to the end of 2024. And, and I want to talk, first of all, about Saudi Arabia and Iran. The detente deal with China as interlocutor was done in 2023. But how has it fared since? And and what does it tell us about his foreign policy approach to that problem called Iran? Well, I think the fact that we're now ending 2024 with Saudi relations with Iran arguably in a stronger position than they were a year before, despite everything that's happened in in Gaza and with the escalation of Iranian-Israeli tit-for-tat strikes and uh, the whole sort of regional political game, the fact that Saudi-Iran ties are thicker and deeper now than they were is testament to the durability of the agreement that was signed in March 2023 in China and to the fact that this agreement has not just been stress-tested in the most extreme circumstances one could have imagined, perhaps not even would have imagined in 2023 in, in March, but that it's been found to be stronger as a result. And I think that indicates the premium that Mohammed bin Salman places on de-risking his part of the world and on ensuring that nothing can derail the laser-like focus he's got to put on, on delivering Vision 2030 and on making sure that enough of the GIGA projects come into uh, some form of reality in the five years that remain, because we have now, 2023 was a halfway point, if you think that Vision 2030 was announced in 2016, and we're now well into the second half of of that 14-year period, where projects have got to get off the drawing board and start to move into delivery and implementation phase. 
And it will be much more difficult for that to happen if uh, the Gulf is once again the scene of a volatile regional conflict. And the fact that so many of the Giga projects are on the Red Sea, even if they're in the northern parts of Saudi Arabia, not not very close to the Yemeni uh, coastline, but the Red Sea has become a byword internationally for for bombs going off and missiles being launched. And clearly, if you're going to start, if you're going to want to attract investors, tourists, and residents as these uh, resorts open over the next few years, you need to have a a stable and calm regional environment. And so I think from a Saudi point of view, that's exactly what they need. And the relationship with Iran to make sure that the conflict in Gaza does not regionalize to the include Iran is is part and parcel of that. Yeah, as you say, um, <laughs> the Red Sea being the, the site of uh, bombs, missiles, uh, drone attacks, not very good for the tourism industry that he wishes to establish. But um, let's look at his relationship with Joe Biden over the past four years. Um, how has that relationship affected his view of America and and also, you know, America is no longer seen as the key player in Gulf security, is it? And that's one of the reasons why Mohammed bin Salman has been very keen to achieve and, and hold on to and build on this detente, as you said, with, with Iran. I mean, it was remarkable in 2023 in March. I think on the 9th of March, there were strategic leaks in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal that outlined the terms of a Saudi-Israeli deal to normalize relations. Clearly, journalists were being briefed, probably by members of the Biden administration, as to the progress of what they would have imagined would be a historic normalization deal. And the very following day, we saw the Saudi-Iran deal. So we saw Saudi normalizing, but not with Israel, with Iran. And it wasn't brokered by the US, it was brokered by China which was remarkable as part of that diversification. And I think it's also consistent with what you were saying about the the view of the US as no longer the only game in town. And, and this is before the war in Gaza began, before the limits of US ability to really make a positive improvement in regional security and stability. Those limits have been severely tested by the inability or unwillingness of the Biden administration to really put pressure on their allies in Israel to at least abide by decisions and uh, that were allegedly being made and then broken by the Israeli leadership. If the Biden administration were unwilling to even make token gestures to try to get the Israeli leadership to to pull back on some of their their more excessive policies, then I think everyone in the Gulf has, has been watching and clearly also uh, drawing uh, parallels with talk about Russia and Ukraine and and especially vis-a-vis the ICC and uh, international accountability. And certainly we've seen, especially in Saudi Arabia, language really becoming much more harsh, not only in terms of uh, talking about Israel, but Mohammed bin Salman, for example, recently labeled Israeli actions a genocide, which was really something to come out of his, uh, his mouth. And this was after Trump had actually won the election. So I think we've seen a hardening of positions. We've seen Gulf states maybe reaffirming their perception of the U.S. as an unreliable actor. We've seen the long shadow of the lack of a U.S. response in 2019 to the Iranian attacks on Abkhaik and oil infrastructure. And I think leaders in the Gulf are contrasting that with the carte blanche the U.S. has given to Israel over the past 14 months and kind of made their own judgments about where they stand in terms of U.S. US priorities, which is perhaps obviously much lower than they would have imagined. And from a Gulf point of view, they they see Biden as one more in a list of leaders from Obama to Trump to Biden that have let them down perhaps by in different ways. So I think Mohammed Salman and others in the Gulf will probably be, well, certainly won't be sorry to see Biden leave office, yeah, clearly a diminished figure in many ways, and are prepared to work with whatever comes next. Speaking about Palestine, uh, 
Mohammed bin Salman, he said privately he doesn't care about the Palestinians, but that, quote, his people do, and that he has to take that into consideration. So when you look at um, Palestine and the Palestinians, how do you think he's handled that particular portfolio since the uh, beginning of the uh, war? Well, I think that quote, if it's, I mean, it certainly rings true, and if it's actually something he'd said, I think it it does encapsulate the dilemma that so a very sensitive and delicate balancing act that he faces to being seen to be doing something, but it's not necessarily something that he would have prioritized before October 7th, 2023. And if you remember, Mohammed Salman gave that Fox News interview about two and a half weeks before October 7th, where he said every day we get closer to a historic breakthrough. And by historic breakthrough, he meant a deal with Israel. And I think nowadays, after a year plus, of the war in Gaza, a historic breakthrough has changed for what he needs from being a historic breakthrough in Saudi-Israeli ties. What he needs to show now is a historic breakthrough in support of a meaningful pathway towards genuine statehood for Palestine. You know, the, the, the terms of a historic achievement have changed. He can't simply make concessions on economic issues, perhaps, to to get Netanyahu to sign off on an agreement, he now needs to really show that he's the one can, who can deliver a Palestinian state, because I think he's also playing on his role as leader-in-waiting of the most powerful country in the Arab and Islamic world. We've seen that in the way that the Saudis have hosted Arab League and OIC meetings and have tried to really establish Saudi Arabia as the one country that can actually convene and rally the wider Muslim community over Palestine. So the stakes have gone up. So even if Mohammed bin Salman before October 7th might not have made this a, a priority, and he said similar things in his 2018 visit to the US as well, if we're to believe uh, you know, comments that were released at the time, that uh, the Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. So what he allegedly said in 2018, but I think the events of the past 14 months are such that there's so much public anger across the Gulf, across the Middle East, and across the wider Arab and Islamic world that he's now really got to deliver something if he's going to come to an agreement with Israel or with the US uh, that involves Palestinians in any in any meaningful way. And and he doesn't need to be in any hurry, does he, to, to do a deal with uh, the Israelis? He doesn't need to satisfy... Joe Biden's aspiration, desperate aspiration to, to to make something happen before the end of his presidency, he can uh, he can hold on to that card well pretty much until he takes up the uh, the cudgel on behalf of the Palestinians. Well, Mohammed bin Salman is not bound by electoral timelines and cycles. He doesn't have those. On the other hand, he only he says, I mean, the normalization card is a card he can he can only play it once, and so. He needs to make sure that he plays that card for all it's worth. And, you know, once you've played that card, you can't do it again. So I think that's his dilemma. How do you play it and when do you play it to ensure that the uh, the odds are stacked in your favor to the maximum point? Now, Biden in 2023, before October 7th, his White House had put so much emphasis into trying to get a Saudi a U.S. brokered Saudi-Israel deal over the line by early 2024 to allow time for Senate ratification of the defense component of it to then allow time for Biden to presumably reap the political benefits. Biden wanted, I think, a foreign policy success to show that he could do what maybe Obama had done in 2015 with the Iran deal and to offset memories of the Afghanistan debacle in 2021. Now, of course, that went south on October 7th. And instead, Biden, who ironically tried to create for himself an image of the foreign policy expert over four decades in politics, his legacy is going to be remembered for the disasters of Afghanistan and now of Gaza, and even of Ukraine, which has perhaps gone awry as well. So a legacy issue then for Biden to blot out his other, well, foreign policy disasters. I think the US under Biden was always looking at it through electoral gain to try and have it done before the election. 
Man but Man was never going to just play that game. He doesn't have to. So the question then is, I suppose, given that Trump's coming into office, given that Trump has this highly transactional approach to policymaking and could easily jettison U.S. long-held positions if he feels it's in his game and in his favor, does that change things? And does Mohammed Salman feel that he can appeal to Donald Trump's kind of transactional streak to make that deal over the some point over the next four years? It may well be the case. You're listening to the Arab Digest podcast with me, William Law, and the golf analyst and author, Christian Coates Uruksen. Arab Digest is a truly independent voice on the Middle East and North Africa. No advertising and no sponsors. In the information overload world in which we all find ourselves, Arab Digest keeps it simple. One insightful article a day and the weekly podcast from top experts, analysts, writers, and commentators. Here at Arab Digest, we have put together a team of contributors you're not going to find anywhere else. Check us out at ArabDigest.org. When you go to the website, be sure and look out for the offer of a free two-month trial to our reader-supported daily newsletter. Now, of course, the rivalry between uh, Mohammed bin Salman and Mohammed bin Zayed has been heating up for some time. Part of Mohammed bin Salman must look at uh, the UAE and think, well, they got that deal with the Israelis, they're reaping benefits, and I still don't have it. That may put some pressure on him. But but I'm just wondering, as, as MBS continues to challenge for, for example, the tourism business, the business markets that the Emiratis have already pretty successfully laid claim to, how, how strained is that relationship becoming, do you think, Christian? Well, I think the, I mean, the, the Abraham Accord signed by the UAE and Bahrain in 2020 with, with Israel isn't necessarily a very good model for the Saudis just because it clearly hasn't improved the Palestinian lot any in any meaningful way. It hasn't stopped Israel either in 2021 from taking heavy actions against Palestinians or, of course, over the past 14 months. And uh, especially for Saudi Arabia being the uh, the custodian of the two holy mosques and for the Al Saud's personal sort of assumption of the mantle of being the leaders of, of Islam, Sunni Islam especially, they they need to show a much more direct rate of return in terms of getting something for the Palestinians than maybe the Emiratis or the Bahrainis had to do. And for them, it was maybe taking annexation off the table, at least at that time, although it hasn't followed through into any meaningful outcome apart from a few joint investments, especially in the UAE. But I think Saudi UAE is going to be continually uh, affected by the fact that so many of the giga projects for Saudi Arabia are trying to move into markets, which, as you say, have been dominated by the Emiratis for the last 20, 25 years. Um, you know, the UAE has a 25-year head start in so many ways in, in transportation and travel and hospitality and tourism. And these are all key parts of Vision 2030. And uh, Dubai is not stopping standing still. I mean, they're, they're, they've introduced measures to further liberalize aspects of lifestyle choices, uh, you know, cohabitation of unmarried couples, for example, and uh, overhauling some of the uh, some of the labor laws, I think, and uh, making it even easier to buy alcohol, for example. So they're, they're, they're not stopping and standing still. Um, 2025, allegedly, we'll see this new this new carrier, uh, Riyadh Air, uh, take to the skies as well. And this is again a direct competition, perhaps, to um, to some of the established Gulf airlines. Even though it only serve, well, primarily serve Saudi Arabia to connect Saudi to the world, but again, it's it's another sort of attempt to try to establish for for Saudi Arabia what the UAE, Abu Dhabi, and Dubai have done for in the 2000s more than 20 years ago now. So there is a risk, I think, that uh, as competition for maybe finite regional markets pots up, that they could become more directly competitive. Hmm. You've talked about Vision 2030 and you know this grand remastering of the Saudi economy and indeed Saudi society. Um, he unveiled it, as you said, back in 2016 to great fanfare and bold claims. 
we've only got five more years to go. Um, so how much of that vision has Mohammed bin Salman actually achieved and, and at what cost? Well, I think it's a vision, not a plan. So it's clearly a roadmap to get from A to B, but B isn't necessarily a defined endpoint. And if you talk to people now, they'll say if we get to 30% or 40% or 50%, we'll be a lot better off than where we started. And obviously, in some respects, they clearly are. I mean, the, the, the proportion of women in the workforce has already been surpassed. 2030 target was already surpassed in about 2021, and it's been far surpassed. So in some key areas, that vision, the targets that were laid out in 2016 were not only achievable, but they're going to be significantly uh, overperforming. The problem is, I think, that Vision 2030 has become so linked in so many people's minds with, with the GIKA projects, especially internationally, that a lot of people outside Saudi Arabia, external observers and investors, will probably uh, look at the progress of the GIGA projects as their way to assess uh, Vision 2030. And in that respect, NEOM or the line, which has been downscaled massively over the past 12 months, is probably going to do more to shape international perceptions of Vision 2030 than any target of you know women's participation in the workforce or Know, private sector growth in Saudi Arabia, you know, those are, I mean, those are the issues that will directly benefit Saudi citizens. But in terms of uh, shaping international perceptions, it will be the sort of 98% reduction in the line, for example, or or any perception that NEOM is still very much a project that is on a drawing board and hasn't yet really come into fruition. And as you say, there's only five years left. Now, I think the decision on the 2034 World Cup will be made in mid-December. And we, I mean, it's effectively a given that Saudi Arabia will host. And I think that actually buys the Saudis' time in the sense that it now establishes a new time horizon of 2034 for many of the projects that they can maybe open in phases. They can open a phase or a sequence in 2030 but then move up to sort of ramp up opening by 2034. And I think that is a good thing for Mohammed bin Salman because it takes the pressure off 2030 and kind of creates a sort of new horizon four years down the line for so many of the projects and for the, and for the expectations. And I think the danger or the risk for Mohammed bin Salman was having, having raised expectations with all the glitz and glamour of the release when, when all the projects were announced, you know, there's a risk of maybe underperforming, under delivering if you overpromise. And so that's why I think we've seen so many signals over the past 12 months through strategic leaks to media about the downsizing, downscaling of the projects. It's about signaling without necessarily coming out and formally saying we're scaling back, but it's about sending signals that these projects aren't going to be as big as that we said they were. And and now 2034 coming along basically gives another four years to, to get something on paper into practice. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's interesting. He's basically, we'll be able to use the World Cup play for time. The downsizing, as you say, is sort of leaking and saying, you know, we're, we're not going to hit some of the big projects, but it has come a long way. And that's a fair point. Although when I look at those giga projects, and as you say, outside investors must look at it and think, why? Why are you building an entertainment city, you know, outside Riyadh? Why did you demolish uh, most of old Jeddah to build this massive complex? What are you doing in Riyadh? What do these have to do with actually diversifying the economy, creating more viable jobs for young Saudis? This obsession with giga projects, I think, really, as you said, has, has, has damaged the uh, interest of outside investors. Well, I think maybe there's an assumption as well by many people in Saudi Arabia that uh, how do these benefit us? You know, we're, we're Saudi citizens. We, you know, our lives are continually. You know, we need to. We, we need economic opportunities. We need jobs. We need to find a way of getting ahead. It's you know, it's hard enough to live in Riyadh or in Jeddah with all the congestion 
without adding to it by demolishing city centers and then building this uh, enormous uh, cube, for example, in, in Riyadh, which uh, again has, uh, has caused a lot of uh, controversy just because people who claim it has a striking resemblance to the Kaaba, it's really touched a very raw nerve. If you look at some of the responses in Saudi Arabia to, to those suggestions, it's, you can tell it's really touched a raw nerve there. And in Jeddah, there was a lot of domestic, a lot of local opposition to the plans to demolish neighborhoods. I mean, so I think the, the mismatch between the internal domestic and then the external kind of international components of Vision 2030 has been there from the start. You know, Saudi citizens are going to measure the impact of Vision 2030 by the impact it has on their, on their lives. Whereas international investor, international kind of observers will will look at things like investment levels in Saudi Arabia, and those have collapsed. I mean, those levels of investment into Saudi fell sharply in 2017 after the Ritz Carlton affair, when a lot of the business elites who might have been expected to be the partners of international investors suddenly vanished into the Ritz Carlton for for weeks and months, and they've struggled to recover, and so. A lot of the Saudi assumptions in 2016 17 that there would be a lot of foreign investment coming in to finance the projects have been shown to be uh, misplaced. And instead, what the Saudis are doing is basically financing the projects themselves, which also feeds into the need for oil prices to remain at a certain level to generate the revenues to pay for the projects. And ironically, in announcing 2030 back in 2016, Mohammed bin Salman gave a television interview to Al Arabiya, where he actually said, I think that by 2020, we can live without oil. And instead, he's got the opposite. He's now in a situation in 2024, 25, where he actually needs oil prices to be at a certain level, because he, he, he's got a situation where the projects are eating up so many resources, and investment simply isn't covering it. Mm, yeah. And just, just finally... Then, Christian, uh, Donald Trump back in the White House in January. I was thinking about Donald Trump and he had that billboard with all of the uh, military hardware that he was going to sell to the Saudis and Mohammed bin Salman sitting on, uh, you know, looking in. And, and the, the inference was that basically the Saudis are just a cash cow for Donald Trump to, uh, you know, to use as he saw fit. I'm just wondering how enthusiastically MBS will embrace this. Well, more, more powerful uh, and triumphant Trump coming in on January 20th. Well, I think that specific incident in the Oval Office in 2018 was probably quite embarrassing for the Saudis, especially when Trump turned to MBS and said, that's peanuts for you. And um, you know, the perception that he saw the Saudis as purely a cash cow probably was reinforced by then the subsequent investment into uh, Jared Kushner's investment company from the PIF, uh, allegedly against the advice of their business and investment committee. So it certainly certainly is a perception, perhaps, that the Trump family thinks that way. I think from a Saudi point of view, they will, I mean, they will work with Trump. He's transactional, they're transactional. They'll try and find a, a modest vivendi. I think maybe the Saudis are probably like the rest of the world to go into this with eyes wide open this time around. In 2017, I think there was a perception that maybe the Saudis felt that Trump would swing U.S. policy in, in their way, in their favor, especially over Qatar, over the uh, blockade, which Trump initially supported and then changed his mind. And I think they learned their lesson that Trump is just as unpredictable as any. I mean, he can just change his mind on a whim. He can change it once and change it back. And then, of course, I think the legacy of 2019 and of the fact that the Trump administration did not do anything to support the Saudis or the Emiratis, not just on September 14th with the Abkhaz attack, but for months beforehand, the months of attacks on maritime and energy targets in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, that has continued to reverberate. If anything, that was the single event that changed the last five years of Gulf politics where the Saudis and Emiratis immediately began to reach out to Iran separately, which is also interesting, they didn't do it together, did it separately, to de-escalate. And we've seen that led to the March 2023 agreement to restore relations, and that has led to the continuing diplomacy across the Gulf 
over the past 14 months since the war in Gaza. And the question is, do the incoming Trump two officials recognize the legacy of that decision in 2019? Or do they just think they can come in and reimpose maximum pressure 2.0 as if nothing changed? And if if the Trump two administration thinks they can just come in and act like it's December 2020 all over again, the Abrahamic courts have just been signed and Iran is under maximum pressure, I think they're going to have a quite a rude awakening because the Gulf itself has has moved a long way over the past four years. And arguably, a lot of it was put in motion by by that one decision in 2019 by the Trump administration not to intervene to or not to do anything to support their Saudi partners. Yeah, that uh, attack on the Saudi Aramco facilities at Abqaiq in 2019, devastating attack, precision attack. The Saudis thought, well, the Americans have our back. They looked over the shoulder and, and Donald Trump wasn't there. That was a seismic shift that uh, perhaps the Trump people coming in won't realize. And then that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. So we'll, we will just watch and see what 2025 brings. Uh, I'm sure lots of interesting points. Uh, but it, for now, we'll call it a day. And thank you, Christian. Oh, thank you for having me. My guest today on the Arab Digest podcast was Christian Coates Uruksen, a Middle East fellow at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy in Houston, Texas. Would you like to support our independent voice? Our funding comes only from our subscribers. No advertising and no sponsors. Head to our website at arabdigest.org where you can find out about our reader-supported daily newsletter and how to get a free two-month trial. The newsletter features the very best of Middle East, North Africa analysts, commentators, and writers, contributors like Christian. Check us out at arabdigest.org. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And search our library of more than 250 podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Amazon, or other platforms. Our podcast guests provide unique insights. Insights you're not going to find anywhere else. That's a big reason why a quarter of a million people have listened to our podcasts since we launched back in 2020. And we thank you for listening. I'm William Law, editor of the Arab Digest. Essential reading, essential listening from independent sources. Thank you.